Hello, on this week of September 7th, we're going to talk about coronavirus, remembering 9-11, critical race theory, and the Trump-Biden election. Thanks for joining us for Prophetic View. Hi, my name is Dave Lewis, the founder of Apologetics from the Attic. Check out our website, apologeticsfromtheattic.com. On this series, this regular program, weekly program called Prophetic View, we are going to talk about current events from a biblical perspective and just try to give everybody a take from a biblical worldview as to what is going on in our culture and how we should use the lens of the Bible to understand it. So there's several topics we could talk about. Uh, let's talk about 9-11 first. So 9-11 was Friday. We remembered 9-11. Um, I personally was 19 years old. I was a student in the Teen Challenge program. I remember being in Raresburg. Uh, they call it God's Mountain, the big Teen Challenge out in eastern Pennsylvania. And we were working in the kitchen. I worked in the kitchen at the time. And I remember that we were dealing with, uh, you know, cleaning up breakfast and somebody comes in and said, I think the first thing I heard was somebody shot missiles at the World Trade Center. And then I remember everything got canceled that day and we went to the chapel for a prayer meeting and they just let, it, let us watch the news all day. And we just sat there in, in shock and amazement. Um, the one picture I remember was burned in my memory was remember that picture when the uh, or this video where the ta when the tower collapsed, someone was standing in the street and there was a video camera pointed toward the direction of the debris, the smoke coming. And it was coming straight toward and the person like ducked into a shop and it was like, man, that is crazy. And, you know, that changed everything. That was a. Uh, life-changing event for all of us and one thing that was missed from a biblical perspective I think and um, I, I would encourage you to go back and listen and find if you google it I'll google it right now while I'm talking just to make sure it's it's you can find it easily but I'm pretty sure you can um, just type dividing line James White September um, September 11th, 2001. Yeah, first, it's the first uh, result. The first result. Well, maybe not, maybe not. If you go on Sermon Audio, it's definitely there. Um, his September 11th episode is excellent. And, you know, what? in what sense is God's judgment upon our nation? And this is going to be a theme of this episode, The Prophetic View think that a lot of things that go on um, in our nation are God's judgment because of our national sins. So this is one that I think was forgotten about. Uh, this is still related to 9-11. So I made this meme, dragged it over onto the main screen if you're watching here. And I wrote, um, so this was back in 2019. This was a year ago. 18 years ago, God's judgment fell on America. And I had a picture of the second plane hitting the second World Trade Center. Then I wrote, 18 years later, depravity is celebrated on the same site. So a lot of people don't remember this. Let me pull over the news story. This is from uh, Daily Caller. Daily Caller. Um uh, t t t January 23rd, 2019. Headline, World Trade Center lit up in pink to celebrate abortion bill. One World Trade Center or the Freedom Tower glowed pink Tuesday night to celebrate New York's passage of a bill expanding abortion access and codifying a woman's right to abort under state law. I am directing the New York's landmarks to be lit in pink to celebrate this achievement and shine a bright light forward for the rest of the nation to follow New York Governor Andrew Cuomo said in Tuesday's statement. So, here's a great example 
of the judgment that should fall on our nation. So we have this wake-up call on 9-11 and God's waking up our country to say, return to me, repent, turn from your sins. Now, first of all, you understand something. The evangelical church literally has no framework or foundation to say that an act of terrorism can be a sign of God's judgment. We just don't have that. We just don't have that in our, in our vocabulary, in our theological understanding. But I really believe that's an important thing. And we're going to see, I'm going to read a scripture or two here to, to, to give us that sense that the Bible does teach that God's judgment can fall upon a nation and God's judgment is falling upon our nation and biblical history teaches us that God brings his judgment through the instrumentality of other humans and of wicked men and that's how he brings his judgment and why would God not judge a nation that celebrates the immorality of murdering the unborn in the womb on the same site that he sent judgment through the instrumentality of the terrorists of 9-11. That's my point on this. And now we're in 2020, and we still have escalating immorality. I mean, the big story that's all over the internet is this uh, movie Cuties, this documentary-style movie on Netflix, which has 11-year-olds, and it's supposedly against the sexualization of young children. But in making the point of being against sexualization of, of underage children, it sexualizes underage children. So we have a nation that's falling deeper and deeper into sexual immorality, public sexual immorality, when you start to exhibit young children in major media platforms for pedophiles to enjoy watching, you're really slipping further and further away. And I saw John MacArthur on an interview on Fox News, and he was talking, we'll talk about that when we talk about coronavirus. Uh, that's another thing going in the news this week. But he was, uh, he, he was asked a question about this, and he said, look, you know, when we started to, when we redefined marriage, and we started this slide, and then we, we in the transgender issues and all these issues, you, you think it's going to stop? It's not going to stop. Human depravity is not going to stop. It's not. It doesn't have brakes on it. And that's what we're seeing. So, and then God sends a global pandemic. So what else will it take to get our attention? What else will it take to show us that as a nation, we need to repent? Now, will that happen? I mean, the president of the United States would need to get up and use the bully pulpit as presidents did in the past like abraham lincoln and declare a national day of repentance declare a day of fasting and prayer but obviously you know you can say what you want about president trump but i don't think he's going to get up there and call for repentance that's what we need you know and and it's just not happening and the nation's been given over um, let's talk next about COVID. So here's your, and I want to show you something because I haven't talked, I talked about COVID a lot when it first happened. I mean, I have a whole series. If you look at apologetics from the addict.com on, um, the, uh, um, I call it, uh, uh, coronavirus and the theology of the cross. I have episode after episode after episode. I went through, I released one episode a day on Holy week. So I want to show you. So as you can see, here's the current dashboard, COVID-19 dashboard, Johns Hopkins University. Um, 28,850,901 global cases. 921,619 global deaths. And then, you know, and then look at this. Here's a, here's just a, I paused on YouTube, one of my first videos. Look at, look at what it was back then. If you're watching, look at the comparison. There was, uh, there. Does it show have the release date? March fifth. This is March fifth that I did this video. 
So we only had 80,000 confirmed cases. Look at the United States map. <laughs> look at the United States map then and look at it now. And there was only 2,900 deaths and now there's 921,619 deaths. And of course, you know, where are we at with coronavirus now? Well, it's a completely political issue at this point. And at least in the people I talk to, I mean, it, the virus now has to do with whether you're pro-Trump or anti-Trump. The virus now has to do with your political leanings. And all of the scientists, it doesn't matter what they say, it's always filtered through, well, mask is a form of oppression. Or, you know, the mask doesn't make any difference, the CDC has stated. Um, and the media just continues to report it. Although if you look at the mainstream media, they'll report the rise in cases. But they never talk about deaths. Because deaths are down. Although about a thousand people a day die. But a thousand people a day die of a lot of communicable diseases. Um, so my position is somewhat of a middle position. Then you have in the church, you have, uh, you know, you got the two extremes are Andy Stanley and John MacArthur. So Andy Stanley, you know, his latest thing was, uh, you know, he's canceling church into 2021 regardless. Uh, Michael Brown had a good article where he talks about, he agrees with both. It was, it was interesting how he uh, did that. But uh, then you got John MacArthur who, uh, I got that. I could pull that over on my Twitter. Um, here's Johnny, Johnny Mac. California court has issued a preliminary injunction against Pastor John MacArthur and Grace Community Church, banning them from conducting or participating or attending any indoor worship service. Well, it's Sunday, and I saw he had his service. So one, I you know I love John MacArthur, and you know I I'm not. I do not want to turn this into a division in the body of Christ. I mean, it, 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 at the end of the day, it's not my church. I don't attend the church. It's across the country in California. I'm in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, it, it, whatever they choose to do, that's between them and God. But the one thing that bothers me is every, and if you watch it, every time John MacArthur gets up to preach, he gets this standing ovation not because they're getting ready to hear the word of God preached, but because it's this protest against the government of California and John MacArthur's their leader who's standing up valiantly against the political forces that would that would uh, oppress them. And I'm just like, I don't know. I mean, you know, my initial reaction to John MacArthur, what he did early on was they kind of went out of their way when they had their first big in-person service to uh, not social distance people and nobody was wearing a mask. And it was kind of like, whoa, you could have at least, you know, had some people wearing masks and stuff. And they cut to the crowd in that <laughs> in that particular sermon. They cut to the crowd like, you know, they have a camera angle where they show the crowd. They cut to that way more often. They you, They barely ever do that. In John MacArthur's video sermons. But at the end of the day, you know, more power to them. I mean, I think that each church has to do what they think is right. And we got to avoid the throwing mud at each other. So John MacArthur doesn't love his neighbor. And uh, he, he's, he's killing people because he's spreading the virus and doesn't care. And this is a bad witness. He's, he's breaking uh, the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that's a little too... Much is going to divide the body of Christ. But then on the what's the other extreme? The other extreme is, well, you, um, you leftists, you Christians who um, aren't having service, you are bowing the knee to Caesar. And you are, you are disobeying Christ as you bow the knee to Caesar as you do not have indoor church service. And it's just like, look. Each, each person is going to decide what they're going to do. Each individual church is going to do what they're going to do. Each denomination is going to decide to do what they're going to do. It is what it is. You know, I mean, I don't know where to come down on it. My church right now is meeting under a tent. And that's been working out because the weather's been pretty decent. But eventually, they're going to have to decide 
you know, what to do. Are we going to move inside or not? And, you know, I think that there's some division and there's some people with different opinions. And, uh, you know, what are we going to do? I don't know. Uh, but it is what it is, you know. So, the, you know, coronavirus is, it's still a thing. You know, early on, uh, my view of it was influenced by the fact that a pastor, Pastor Lovey Scott, who was an 80-year-old pastor, a uh, black pastor here in the area, who I personally knew very well and, and, and loved the guy, he died from it. And he was sitting there in a hospital on a ventilator for a month, and he succumbed to it, and he died. Um, and that's just, it was, it really shook me to go, okay, this thing's pretty serious. Because, and then, you know, of course, early on, the, 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 the pictures from New York City and the mass amount of death in New York City uh, was shocking to America. I remember the New York Times uh, featured, what was the place that, um, that you know, and they, they, they said three million people are going to die in the next couple of months. It was, and everyone was like, and then there was the run on toilet paper. No one had any toilet paper. And, you know, it was, uh, those were some crazy times. I mean, it doesn't feel like that anymore uh, with the COVID. It really doesn't. It doesn't feel with that, like, oh, my gosh, everybody's going to die kind of panic thing. I don't think anyone, even the most, oh, coronavirus is so dangerous, I'm staying in my home type of people, I still don't think that it's the same even for them. I think there's a lot more. Well, yes, it's dangerous, and yes, it kills people, but it's not so dangerous that we need to freak out because millions of people are going to die in the matter of a couple months. And, you know, then what was the one, the CDC report that supposedly everyone, I don't understand. James White made this point too. I don't understand why everyone t took that as breaking news, you know, of the 140,000 people that died only 9,000. It was only COVID. Um, and there was no other comorbidities. That's been known for months. I never, I didn't understand why that was. Oh, look, 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 conspiracy, see, see, see. People die with COVID versus dying of COVID. Listen, this is a virus, or this is a, it kills, it kills elderly people. Just like, you know, newsflash, you don't die of old age. You usually die because... An, an, an opportunistic infection hits you and you die of pneumonia or you die of heart failure, you die of some liver failure, you die of organ failure, you die from some kind of virus, some kind of bacteria. Okay, that's how people die. And they're called comorbidities. So there's multiple factors that lead to somebody's death. So COVID-19, when it's caught by a certain groups, they die because they already have health problems. And COVID-19 is an opportunistic infection, which takes their life. But that doesn't mean that, that we should do this whole conspiracy theory thing of like, well, see, they're trying to over-report COVID deaths for some kind of political thing. Now, look, I, I could be a conspiracy theorist. I mean, if I'm not careful, you could see me start a, start a podcast on right-wing conspiracies to the day is long. I mean, I'll tune into Alex Jones just to see what he's talking about. And he's going... <laughs> I mean, this is the Chinese, this is the Chinese, this New World Order releasing this man-made virus on the earth to usher in the New World Order and One World Government. Uh, you know, we could really go go in on that. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the COVID. Um, you know, I think that we need to really, as Christians, um, seek to be reasonable in this and uh, give people the freedom to respond to it how they will um, i think people have felt like they don't have the freedom to disagree on this and then just a reminder from the from the biblical perspective on this um, as far as how to understand this biblically uh coronavirus uh, here's a meme that i let me drag this over if you're watching i had put this meme out a while ago it got some, it got some response and reaction, uh, but it, it's a, it's a picture of the, the, the horse, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the green horse with the rider of death. And I wrote the releasing of plagues on earth, including coronavirus or COVID-19 to be technically correct, because COVID-19 is a type of coronavirus. 
The releasing of plagues on earth, including COVID-19, has always been a fulfillment of the four seals being broken by the lamb who was slain. Study the quote-unquote idealist interpretation of the book of Revelation. So, you know, one, one possible interpretation of the book of Revelation, and the best modern expositor of this is uh, Greg Beale. Greg Beale. Um, his, it's really difficult to get his uh, commentary on Reformation for less than $100, or on Revelation, for less than 100 bucks. It's, it's, I was looking to buy it recently and couldn't find it for any less than that. But see, you have, you have the throne scene in heaven in, in Revelation 4. And then you have the scroll and the lamb in Revelation 5. And it's clear that the lamb who was slain but is now enthroned and exalted to the right hand of the Father, he's been given authority to break the seals of the scroll. And as he breaks the seals, that's where you have the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, your most common modern evangelical interpretation of the book of Revelation is, is futurism. So when you read in Revelation 6, you should take a minute and read that, and you read where the lamb is breaking the seals, right? You have four horses. You have the white horse. You have the uh, red horse. You have the green or pale horse. And then you have the... Um, Wait, the third one is the, that's the black horse. And then the fourth one is the pale green horse. And the futurists will say, well, this is, this is clearly talking about future events. They haven't happened yet. There will come a time where there will be this cataclysmic war, uh, you know, the white horse. And this cataclysmic, um, you know, well, actually, the white horse, there before was a white horse, he rose as a boat to conquer. And then a red horse, power to take each other from the earth, take, men were given power to take each other's lives and then the uh the black horse is about famine and then the pale horse is about it says uh its rider was death and hades was falling close behind him they were given a power over the fourth of the earth to kill by sword famine plague and the wild beasts of the earth the idealist view would say this is the coming of the kingdom of god Every, this is the lamb who was slain presiding over the bringing forth of his kingdom and he's been bringing forth his kingdom and gathering his subjects of his kingdom and judging the rebels against his kingdom ever since his ascension and the sending of the spirit and the calling forth of the church. And every time you see a war, every time you see a famine, every time you see a plague, every time you see that, that is the lamb on the white horse. And this, the idealist view, I think, would normally interpret the white horse as the conquering of the gospel. That the gospel goes forth to conquer the hearts of men and bring them into the kingdom. But then the kingdom is also coming through, through war, famine, pestilence, plague, and disease. So when we see these events happening in our world, we can be assured that the Lamb of God is on his throne. And he is breaking the seals. And I think that's very comforting. To me, anyway. I think that's a comforting comforting thing. Two more topics. Um, critical race theory. And uh, intersectionality. And Black Lives Matter. And the riots and all this kind of thing. So, I don't know if you've seen some of these videos. But I'm going to play them for you. Um, here's this one. So, this is one where it's this woman giving one of these uh, racial sensitivity trainings. So she's an African-American woman, and there's a bunch of Caucasian white people in this room. And listen to what she says to them. Listen to this. Listen to this. So if you are, uh, I don't want to maximize the screen because there's some tweets put up with some curse words on it, and you can't really see them. Uh, but I can read to you what's on. You can kind of see what's on the whiteboard. All white people are racist. So she has written on that board, all white people are racist. So listen to what she says to this room full of white people. So <laughs> I put this. So she la and then she has this weird laugh when she says that kind of stuff, either because she doesn't believe it or because she's just so amazed to be put in a situation where she can stand in front of a room full of white people and just call them all racists uh, with no evidence. Because here's the thing about this critical race theory. It's a systemic problem. 
So it doesn't matter if you personally in your heart are a racist. You're default a racist because you're part of a racist system. So it's Marxist categories applied to cultural situations. This up because I really want any white person in the room to know up front that this is what we're dealing with, that it's not going to be this coddling of white tears and what that looks like. We're not going to discuss, oh, maybe some of us have worked it out. No, you're always going to be racist, actually. You're always going to be racist, actually. So even when you're on your path to trying to figure out how to be a better human being, um, because I believe that white people... And then if you're watching the camera pans to all these white people just sitting there going, okay. People are born into not being human. Like that actually, instead of <laughs> people of color... So you're born not being human. You're subhuman. So this ends up becoming a very dangerous worldview. So for some people in this movement, white people are actually subhuman. And the, this is the language that, that is underneath all movements that end up committing genocide. We can kill people because they're subhumans anyway. You have to dehumanize the enemy in order to kill them. And black folks being dehumanized, that actually everyone is dehumanized off rip within white supremacy, that y'all are born into a life to not be human, and that's what y'all are taught to do, to be demons. So we're taught to be demons. So we're born into white supremacy. We're all white supremacists because of the color of our skin. We're white supremacists. And by the way, in critical race theory, you can be African American and still be, a, be white because it's a mentality. It's a worldview you're into whiteness so in this particular so there was her little giggle when she called white people demons you're taught to be demons and she did that little giggle again okay white people are all racist so i just want y'all to know that up front okay so white people are all racist she just wants them to know that up front so in case you have you need to do some research on this and in the in the links to the show i will put a couple things um Albert Muller had a interview with a guy. I'll post that one up. Uh, an hour-long interview with a guy who is an expert in uh, critical race theory. And then I thought Tim Poole. And, and just, you know, as a side issue, where I, I listen to Ben Shapiro every day. I catch Tim Poole every day. I, if I'm driving around, I'll listen to Rush Limbaugh and, uh, you know, try to catch him. I'll check out Glenn Beck. Um, I also... To just be balanced, I try to check out CNN. I will listen to like Chuck Todd on Meet the Press, just to get, you know, an idea of what he's, what's going on with him. Uh, and just I try to do a, a spectrum. I try not to just like I'm not going to sit there and watch Fox News continually, and just get there. Although I check out Tucker Carlson. You, if you don't watch Tucker Carlson, you should check him out. He's he's pretty good. And uh, you know, Tim Poole's a guy who you should check out his YouTube channel because he's got good stuff. He's a he's a liberal. He's a traditional Democrat, but he's voting for Trump and he'll give you all the reasons why. But anyway, just try to get this broad. And I ch always listen to James White dividing line. I'm a dividing line devotee. Been listening to dividing line for like 17 years now. Um, listen to lots of his stuff uh, to get to get up in current events, Albert Moeller. Yeah. So, so uh, in other words, my original point here was to tell you, um, a couple, you know, and, and look up James White, go onto his website and, and look up everything he has to say about critical race theory. He's got good stuff. And, uh, Vadi Bauckham, check out his stuff on, on this topic. Um, and, you know, do your research on what critical race theory is, because basically what it is, is it's, uh, communism, Marxist, theory which mainly applied to economics so in marxist theory you had the bourgeois and the proletariat you had the ones who held money and they have the wealth and they control the wealth by manipulating it so that if you're a wealthy person you're born into that class system and that's a system that you're born into if you're born into wealth you have that money you control it and then there's the masses that are kept poor so the way that system is o overthrown is through a revolution in Marxism. So if you're part of the rich 
uh, you know, part of the society, you're automatically bad. You're the oppressor class. You're the wealthy class. You must be dismantled and destroyed so that the poor can rise up and the wealth can be redistributed. Well, those categories are now been applying to cultural things. So they're saying if you're white in America, you're part of a racist system. And through revolution, you must be overthrown. So I want you to check this one out. This one really bothered me. So this is... Uh, Breitbart and this is a Breitbart so this was in raw no DC this was a DC shooting what was this one I this might have been the one where the guy clearly was pulling the gun on the cop so I don't I don't think these one la I think this protest lasted a couple of days and it was over because uh, generally if it's a very clear-cut case of, well, actually, the guy was pulling a gun on a cop, and that's why he got shot. They usually don't. Those protests die out pretty quick because there's really not a lot of leverage to keep protesting. But the this, I just want you to hear this one chant, and it tells you everything you need to know. Because if you wonder what, what justifies these people, how they treat the police, and then what justifies them not caring when destruction rioting looting and murder happens well this is this chance all you need to know about this movement and the philosophical and worldview underpinnings of it listen to what this woman shouting to the cops and then this guy over here this chant got stuck in my head over like the last week and it's, it's really listen to what they say I'm part of a racist system there's no such thing as a good cop in a racist system sorry no good cops in a racist system. No good cops in a racist system. No bad protesters. No revolution. No bad protests in the revolution. So did you hear that chant? So there's no good cops in a racist system. So and then you know earlier in the video, I can't play the video because there's cursing. It's crazy and they're screaming at the cops, saying, "I will murder you." And then there's a couple of black cops and they're taunting them, getting in their face. These cops re exercise such restraint, man. They're getting cursed at. And this is on Breitbart. I'll put the link up in the show notes uh, if you want to watch the video because it's, it's very, very crazy. So there's no good cops in a racist system. So if the system is declared racist by these people, by the Black Lives Matter, Antifa, uh, these uh, critical race theory, so it doesn't matter. You could not have a racist bone in your body, and you are declared a racist. And, and notice, if you are considered part of the racist system, you are fair game for, at best, being taunted and slandered and screamed at. And at worst, you know, if you get killed, it's just part of it. It's just part of it. I mean, where's Drudge? Where's Drudge today? Uh, today is a Sunday. Uh, um Okay, well, he put NFL. <laughs> he put NFL on the front page. That he took that. Uh, uh, t t t the two deputies murdered. Two LA deputies ambushed. This was the story today, that came out on a Sunday morning. On September thirteenth. Trying to get the link to load up here. It's not loading, but uh, there was two. And you know, and what justifies that? Uh, sorry, my. My uh, computer is lagging here because it's trying to uh, catch this. I got to get a better screen recorder system. Extended video radio calls provide details of ambush attack on L.A. County Sheriff's deputy. Interesting. So, yeah, we had this guy just walk up on him and shoot him. And shoot him just get attacked and then the word was that uh the um protesters came to the hospital and were trying to wish for his death wish for the cops to die and good it's, it's good that you're dead you pig cops so there's no good cops in a racist system so that's why the cops are all racist it, it's irrelevant if you're part of the system you're part of the problem it all needs to be torn down, defunded, and destroyed. And then you have this second chant. No bad protesters in a revolution. No bad protesters in a revolution. So 
that's what justifies. So if, if it's the ends justify the means, if it's in the name of a revolution, there can be destruction, death, burning, carnage, because it's all for the sake of the revolution. That's what makes these people dangerous, because their consciences have been seared because of you know the you know what's going on. Now, I want to read a text of scripture. I mean, what's behind all this? What's behind all the violence, the death, the destruction? And remember, this is called prophetic view because we, we read from John Calvin that the proper way to apply the Old Testament prophets is to discover how God was acting during the time of the nation of Israel and understand because God does not change, this is how he deals with nations in our day. And we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 10, okay? And we're going to see what God does when he acts. Isaiah chapter 10, starting at verse 1. It reads, Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. What will you do on the day of reckoning, when disaster comes from afar? To whom will you run for help? Where will you leave your riches? Nothing will remain but to cringe among the captives or fall among the slain. Yet for all of this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. So the, the first four verses here, of course, are uh, Israel is being rebuked by the prophet for their sin. And the laws and decrees that they have made um, are are specifically noted by the prophet that they withhold justice they deprive the poor of their rights uh, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless so many times money power greed and that human nature that fallen nature of humans where we desire power and greed and money control of others above all things becomes enshrined into laws and decrees and we could go on and on about how that happens in our country and like we already talked about abortion being one of the one of these type of things that is enshrined in law and then the lord says what are you going to do when my reckoning comes now the question is uh, and of course you know riches money is not a savior when god brings his judgment now then you got to keep reading because then what God does is he speaks of how this wrath is going to manifest itself. And look how it manifests itself. Verse 5. Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. I send him against a godless nation. I dispatch him against the people who anger me to seize loot and snatch plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. So, in Isaiah's day, a foreign army, called the Assyrians, marching toward the Israelites in order to conquer them, in order to take their goods, in order to plunder them, in order to trample them down. What is that? What's the interpretation of that? What's the prophetic pronouncement? That that is God's anger. So, if I am angry, and I use a baseball bat to club the object of my anger, that think of that, and what God is saying is, imagine God's hand grasping a club, and expressing his anger at Israel with that club, well, that is these Assyrian people. So, I mean, this is the prophetic view of the Israelites are hearing from God that this foreign army invading them, destroying them, is God's anger against them. How are we to apply this to our day? Well, the rioters the looters, the protesters, burning, pillaging. Could that be an expression of God's judgment against us, against us as a nation? 
Now, there's a lot that goes into this type of application. A lot of issues to think through, a lot of categories to, to understand. You know, well, this is the nation of Israel in the Old Covenant. We're not in the Old Covenant anymore. Does God deal with nations like this anymore in the New Covenant? Is there a difference now? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, you know, we need to get into those issues right now. But I'm applying this to say, at the very least, we see that God has done this in the past. And of course, as Calvin says, we need to study the Old Testament prophets in order to understand what God does in the past, what he has done to deal with his people, because he doesn't change and he will do it today. So what would it look like for Christians to discern the hand of God in this wrath, anger, burning, looting of the rioters and God's sending them to shake us out of our slumber and wake us up. Now I want to read a tech I want to read a paragraph from Calvin's commentary on this on this passage. And here's his application. Calvin says, hence, we ought to learn that the Lord acts even by the hand of the wicked. But here we must think and speak soberly, for it is proper to make a wise and judicious distinction between the work of God and the work of men. There are three ways in which God acts by men. First, all of us move and exist by him. Acts 17.28 Hence, it follows that all actions proceed from his power. Secondly, in a peculiar manner, he impels and directs the wicked accordingly as he thinks fit, and although nothing is farther from their thoughts, still he makes use of their agency, that they may kill and destroy one another, or that by their hand he might chastise his people. Of this method the prophet speaks in this passage. Thirdly, when he guides by his spirit of sanctification, which is peculiar to the elect. Whether, therefore, we are attacked by tyrants or robbers, or any other person, or foreign nations rise up against us, let us always plainly see the hand of God amidst the greatest agitation and confusion, and let us not suppose that anything happens by chance. So, what Calvin's clearly saying there is, this text is teaching us that God uses wicked men to execute his chastisement upon his people and for them to destroy one another. And that's how God uses his wrath. Do, do, we, do we even think like that as Christians anymore in this day? Or have we so confined our thoughts about where God works and where God acts to him being this distant deity in heaven who intervenes from time to time to bring about good things. But basically, the earth and the actions of men are relegated to the free will, and that's it. God has no agency there. He has no hand there, nothing. I think functionally that's where most Christians are. Um, as the Christian Smith in the, uh, the, the book that came out years ago uh, described evangelical Christianity is moralistic therapeutic deism. So many forms of deism I think have taken hold in the evangelical church where God kind of wound up this universe and lets it go and free will is the defining factor and free will kind of reigns supreme. And so for, so your average Christian, their interpretation of watching people burn, pillage, loot, riot, protest. Well, yeah, that's, that's people's free will. They're wicked, they're evil, they do w w evil things. God's up in heaven going, I don't want this to happen. This isn't what I want. I'm so heartbroken that this is going on. And there's no sense in which God has his hand in it. Well, I would challenge you take that view if you have it and run it through Isaiah chapter 10 and tell me if you can come out the other side and the Bible doesn't challenge that view. That there is a, in fact a sense in which God 
is behind these type of things, warning us, judging us, shaking us, calling us to repentance, calling us to turn to him and to repent of our evil and sinful ways. That's the prophetic view of the riots and the looting. Now, does that mean we do nothing? No. And, you know, I was going to talk about Trump and Biden, but we can do that next time. Uh, but, you know, politics and what is the role of governors? What's the role of the police? What's the role of, of a government? Well, the role of a government is to punish evil wherever it occurs. But if the government ceases to do this in a just way, God will send um, Assyrians against a godless nation. And we have fallen as a nation into lawlessness. And it's becoming clear. And we have to ask God and discern what's God doing. And, um, you know, it's, this, is not, <laughs> this is not an easy thing to understand or to, this is why Christians um, seeking to see the hand of God in this world. It's a difficult, prayerful consideration. But we cannot forget that I think the Old Testament clearly teaches that God uses the hand of evil men to chastise his people. And that's what I think he's doing in this modern United States of America. So thanks for joining me for this first uh, official episode of The Prophetic View. If you got some something out of this, please like the, this YouTube video. Please like the Facebook page. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel and share this out. If you're checking out the podcast, leave a review. Give us some five stars so we uh, get up there in the search engines. And just we thank you for this, and I thank you for joining us on Prophetic View, a program of apologetics from the attic. Thanks, and God bless. <laughs>